أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إله الأولين والآخرين وأشهد أن نبينا محمدا عبده ورسوله المصطفى الأمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Welcome to another episode of our tafsir page by page and inshallah ta'ala today we are on page 69 the fourth juz surah to Ali Imran In the previous episode we mentioned uh, we are still discussing the passages concerning the battle of Uhud and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to us a number of principles in the last uh, lesson that we took or the last episode rather that we had and from amongst those principles was the fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would sooner or later die he would pass and so when that rumor emerged in the battle of Uhud that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam died Allah azza wa jalla is saying to the companions and therefore by extension to the Muslims that in times of difficulty and hardship how is it that you're going to respond there are people who become weak in their resolve disheartened there are people who surrender give up they allow shaitan to overpower them and there are people who understand that they are worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Allah azza wa jal is ever living and that he never dies subhanahu wa ta'ala and so there are people who overcome those challenges those whisperings of shaitan and they become stronger with the patience and resolve that Allah azza wa jal endows them with in today's episode, we begin with, with, with verse number 149, and that is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِن تُطِيعُوا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا يَرُدُّوكُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ فَتَنْقَلِبُوا خَاسِرِينَ O you who believe, if you obey the disbelievers, they will make you revert to your old ways, and you will turn into losers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that verse that I just mentioned to you at the beginning of this episode in which Allah Azza wa mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would die just as prophets who came before him died and that if he were to die or were to be killed would you then turn away from your religion turn back and revert to your old ways Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that all you who believe meaning the believers that if you were to obey the disbelievers that is what they would want from you anyway they would want you to turn back to your old ways. And that is essentially what shaitan wants. Shaitan wants people to go back to shirk or to turn to what shirk as opposed to the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you look at the battle of Uhud and even before it, the battle of Badr and all of the subsequent battles that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would fight against the Quraysh, what was the main reason between those battles? What, what was the main reason for the enmity that existed in the hearts of the Quraysh towards the Muslims. It was the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was calling them to the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal alone meant the changing of society that the Quraysh was so accustomed to and the other Arabs as well in Arabia. It meant that they would have to leave off their idol worship. It would meant that they would have to submit to Allah Azza wa Jal alone and therefore the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as their leader, it meant that they had to change the way that they behaved and the way that they treated certain people like their women and their young and their slaves and others. It meant that they would have to make certain transformations within their societies, within their families and about their culture that, that would be more in line with Islam and as opposed to what they were doing before Islam. And that is something which they rejected. They preferred the ways of their ancestors, the ways of shirk, the ways of kufr and disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we know, came to his uncle Abu Talib upon his deathbed in the early Meccan years, Abu Talib has spent his life defending the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, helping him coming to his aid and so on. And now Abu Talib is upon his deathbed. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes to him and he says, Oh my uncle, say a single statement that if you were to say it, I will use it as evidence on your behalf before Allah Azza wa Jal. I will use it to argue on your behalf before Allah Azza wa Jal and Yawm Al-Qiyamah. That one statement that he wanted his uncle to make was La ilaha illallah, the statement of Tawheed. And Abu Talib refused because around him, surrounding him was some of his close 
leaders or some of the other people of Quraysh and some of his family members saying to him, oh, Abu Talib, how can you forsake the religion of your forefathers? How can you forsake the religion of Abdul Muttalib, your father, your grandfather? How can you go away from the ways that they were upon? And so Abu Talib died upon their ways. He died upon their shirk and upon their kufr. And so Allah Azza wa is saying that this is essentially what the disbelievers want from you. It is essentially what shaitan wants from you. Or you who believe, if you were to obey them, they will make you turn away from your religion. That is essentially why the Prophet ﷺ had to fight and to defend the Muslims within the city of Medina and outside the city of Medina because that is what they were fighting for, to protect their religion and their belief. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 150 he then says, No indeed it is Allah who is your protector and he is the best of helpers. So Allah is saying that you don't need them. You see, one of the reasons why you may be tempted to go towards the disbelievers is because they are more in number. They are stronger in terms of what they possess. They are wealthier in terms of what they own. But Allah is saying that you don't need any of them. Because if you were to follow and obey them, فَتَنْقَلِبُ خَاسِرِينَ You will return as losers. بَلِ اللَّهُ مَوْلَاكُمْ But rather Allah is your helper. Allah is your protector. And if Allah is with you by your side, helping you and protecting you, then what else do you need and who else do you need besides him? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa huwa khayrun nasirin. He is the best of helpers. Didn't Allah Azza wa Jal help the Muslims on the day of the Battle of Badr? And even on the day of the Battle of Uhud, where the Muslims suffered what they suffered in terms of loss, their deceased, those martyrs, have the greatest of reward in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. They have an amazing station. So essentially that defeat or that loss that they suffered is not really a loss. It is another way of Allah Azza wa Jal honoring the believers and helping them. And there were lessons and benefits and wisdoms that they attracted from, that they detracted from or that they deduced from the battle of Uhud. And so Allah Azza wa Jal honored them. And then likewise in the battle of Khandaq, the trench battle, and likewise the treaty of Hudaybiyah and the conquest of Mecca and the battle of Tabuk and all of the other expeditions in between that the Prophet ﷺ was a part of and that the Muslims, the companions were a part of, all of it is from the help and the protection that Allah gave to the believers. He is the best of helpers. So those 300 odd Muslims that, forced that, that fought that first battle alongside the Prophet ﷺ on the day of Badr, Within a few short years, they would conquer the Arabian Peninsula. They would be the people who had conquered all of Arabia. And a few short years after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, during the Khilaf of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman anhum the Muslim Empire would expand across the world. Northern Africa, all the way to the tips of Spain, Asia, major parts of Asia, all of them coming under the rule of the Muslims. nasirin. He is indeed the best of helpers. And from the ways and manners in which Allah Azza wa helps and assists the believers, is that which Allah Azza wa then mentions in verse 151. He says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will strike panic into the disbelievers' hearts because they attribute partners to Allah, although He has sent down no authority for this. Their shelter will be the fire. How miserable is the home of the evildoers. Allah Azza wa says that from the ways in which He helps the believers is that He casts terror and panic and fear into the hearts of the disbelievers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would cast the fear of the Muslims into the hearts of the disbelievers even though the disbelievers were more in number, were better equipped, were wealthier, were stronger, were had horses and camels at their disposal that the Muslims did not have. But Allah is the one who controls everything in the heavens and the earth and from that which he controls is he controls the hearts of people. And if Allah wishes to strike panic and fear, then Allah can strike that panic and fear into the heart of whomsoever he chooses subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those non-Muslims, those Quraysh armies that had all of that wealth and all of that might and all of those numbers, when they had fear in their hearts, then that, those numbers 
that might, that weaponry doesn't prevail, doesn't help them in anything besides Allah Azza wa Jal. When it comes besides when it comes to standing besides uh, or in front of opposing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the people that Allah Azza wa Jal loves and honors and supports. And that is why our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that from the things that Allah Azza wa Jal gave to him, unique to him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that he would cast terror into the hearts of his enemies from the distance of a month. Even though the traveling time between the Prophet and the army was a month's journey, they would already start to fear him. And that happened a number of times in the lifetime of the Prophet as is well documented in the books of Sirah. And no doubt that that is something from the greatest of Allah's mercy upon the believers. That Allah makes their enemies fear them, puts enmity, puts, puts fear and panic into their hearts even before they meet and then when they meet as well. And Allah Azza wa Jal says that the enemy, that, that, that panic and that fear that is in the hearts of their enemies, it is because of one thing, and that is the shirk that they make besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because they have turned away from Allah Azza wa Jal and turned away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have chosen the path of shirk, Allah Azza wa Jal says that they will have panic and fear and terror struck in their hearts. That then also shows that the opposite is also true. And that is for the believers, if they want tranquility, they want peace, they want ease of the heart and they want that ability to have that, that confidence within themselves, then the greatest or one of the greatest means of achieving that is through the path of the Tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jal. Those people who worship Allah Azza wa Jal alone, obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, know that they are doing that which Allah Azza wa Jal legislated upon them, worshipping Allah in the way that Allah has ordained and that in the way that He loves subhanahu wa ta'ala, those people will have ease and tranquility and peace in their hearts. So the people of shirk, have terror and panic and, and they have that, 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 that feeling of, of being perturbed because of their shirk, then likewise the opposite is true that the people of Tawheed, because of the Tawheed, have that which Allah Azza wa gives them of tranquility and peace and ease of heart. And that is Allah Azza wa says, بِمَا أَشْرَكُوا بِاللَّهِ مَا لَمْ يُنَزِّلْ بِهِ سُلْطَانًا It is because of that which they attributed as partners to Allah Azza wa for which He sent down no authority. النار, and their destination, their shelter will be the fire, and what an evil and miserable place for the evil doers. In the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in verse 152, He then continues and He says, مِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الدُّنْيَا وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةِ ثُمَّ صَرَفَكُمْ عَنْهُمْ لِيَبْتَلِيَكُمْ وَلَقَدْ عَفَى عَنْكُمْ وَاللَّهُ ذُو فَضْلٍ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah has fulfilled His promise to you. You are routing them. You are routing them with His permission. But then you faltered, disputed the order and disobeyed. Once He had brought you within sight of your goal, some of your goal, some of you desire the gains of this world and others desire the world to come. And then he prevented you from defeating them as a punishment. He has now forgiven you. Indeed, Allah is most gracious to the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse 152 of Surah Ali Imran essentially goes to the crux of the issue of what took place on the Battle of Uhud. And as we said before, the Quran doesn't give to us a play-by-play or a full accounting of what took place in any of these historical events. But rather Allah azza wa jal chooses certain moments of what took place and he extracts from it lessons and principles for us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Allah Azza wa had fulfilled his promise to you. The promise of Allah Azza wa came when the believers followed and obeyed the commands of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that shows therefore the principle is in our religion that so long as you continue to obey Allah and obey his messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will always have victory. You will always have that which Allah Azza wa promised. Even in times of hardship and difficulty, Allah Azza wa turns that for you in as a means of blessing, as a means of expiation, as a, as a means of reward. So at the beginning of the battle, when the Muslims and the Quraysh were, were fighting head on, the Muslims were winning. And the Muslims were winning because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we mentioned before in the previous episode, had stationed his soldiers in an extremely intelligent and militaristically uh, intelligent way. He had placed those companions in places that didn't allow the Muslims to be routed. 
routing means that the, that the Quraysh could come and attack the flanks and the rear of the army of the Muslims. So they were protected from all sides. They had natural protection by way of the mountains and they have these archers that are protecting the flank of the Muslims. The Muslims are attacking head on and as Allah Azza wa told us just in the verse that we just mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strikes fear and panic in the hearts of the enemies of Islam. And so they're fighting and the Muslims are winning. The disbelievers are running away and fleeing from the battlefield. And as they were running away, what many of them were doing because they're fleeing for their lives and they're worried for their lives, they're leaving behind their weapons. They're leaving behind their armor, their shields. They're leaving behind other types of wealth that they were carrying and they're just running for their lives. Now the rule of the battlefield is that whoever picks up that weaponry, those shields, that armor, that wealth, it belongs to them. It, is, it belongs to them. And so the Muslims that are on the battlefield, as those enemies are leaving and they're fleeing from the battlefield, they're picking up that wealth, they're picking up that armor. And as we know, the Muslims, generally speaking, generally, were quite poor. The Muslims were people, especially the Muhajirin, who had to leave behind in Mecca their wealth, their land, their property, everything that they owned. Their people were poor. And so these Muslims are benefiting now. You have these few dozen archers upon that mount that the Prophet ﷺ told to them, stay, don't leave until you hear from me. Even if you see us being killed, don't move. They say to their leader who's with them upon that mountain, they say, the battle's over. Our brothers are taking from the battlefield the, the booty of war. They're taking these possessions and we're not going to get anything. Nothing will be left for us because we're stuck on this mountain. Let us go and share. Their leader said, no, didn't you hear the Prophet say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, don't leave until you hear from me explicitly? Those companions disagreed and they said, yes, he said that, but he meant during the battle. The battle's over now. These people have fled, they've run, they've gone. And so it's all over, now we can go. And so they disobeyed their leader, they disobeyed the command of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is why Allah Azza wa Jal says that at the beginning you were routing them, you were winning by Allah's permission because you had obeyed Allah and obeyed His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. حَتَّى إِذَا فَشِلْتُمْ وَتَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ وَعَصَيْتُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا أَرَاكُمْ مَا تُحِبُّونَ But then you faltered, you disputed the order, you disobeyed once He had brought you within the sight of your goal, meaning the sight of victory. And so what did they do? Many of those companions on the arch, on the, on the mountain, those archers, they fled. They, oh, they didn't flee, but rather they left their posts and they came and they started to take from the war booty as the other Muslim soldiers were doing. So only the leader of that company of archers and a few of the companions were left. As they had done this, and this is essentially one of the main lessons therefore, that just that simple uh, disobedience of one simple command and it was a misunderstanding those companions didn't hate Islam they didn't want the Muslims to be defeated they genuinely thought that the army no no longer needs them to be in their post the, the, the battle's over it's finished it's done we are now free to leave but it shows that sometimes even within our lives we leave a sunnah we leave something that we consider to be small we know that Allah and His Prophet ﷺ commanded something or prohibited us from something and we ignore it because we consider it to be insignificant. But the repercussions, the consequences of that can be de great indeed, as we see here in the Battle of Uhud. And so they leave. So Khalid ibn Walid, as we said in a previous episode, he sees what's going on. He realizes that these archers now are just a handful, easily overcome. So he gathers his cavalry together and they go and attack those archers. They kill them and now they flank the Muslims and they rout them. The Muslims are now shocked because all of a sudden now there's an army behind them. And that is as we know when you're facing forward to be attacked from behind is something which causes panic within the ranks. The other Quraysh army, the rest of the Quraysh army, they see what's going on. They also regroup and they attack the Muslims head on. So now the Muslims are the ones pent in by mountains on either side, by enemies in front and behind. Allah Azza wa is saying, Minkum min yuridu dunya. Some of you, you wanted from the world. You saw possessions, you saw wealth, and that's what you rushed towards. Wa minkum min yuridu al-akhira. And others from amongst you, you wanted the akhira. And those are the ones who remained even on that day in the, in the, in the heat of the battle, 
in the ferociousness of the battle when the Muslims were being penned in and attacked from all sides, they are the ones who remain firm and steadfast with the Prophet ﷺ. Companions and there was only a handful of them who remained with him and they continued to fight and they continued to stand by him ﷺ. Allah says, <coughs> ثُمَّ صَرَفَكُمْ عَنْهُمْ لِيَبْتَلِيَكُمْ Then he prevented you from them as a punishment. And so Allah Azza wa Jal, even in this difficult situation, the Muslims were able to extract themselves from that situation. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we know, and the companions like Abu Bakr and Umar, رضي الله عنهم اجمعين, and a number of other companions, were able to extract themselves from that position. And the Quraysh army essentially leaves. They leave, even though they've killed a number of the companions and injured the Prophet ﷺ, but they leave defeated. How do the Quraysh leave defeated? Because the whole purpose of this battle was to come and to kill the Prophet ﷺ, to kill the likes of Abu Bakr and Umar عنهما, and to defeat the Muslims once and for all. To be done with the Muslims once and for all. But essentially what they find instead is that they don't have any recourse except to return back to the city of of Mecca. And so they weren't able to kill the Prophet Wasallam. They weren't able to defeat the Muslims and to destroy them. They weren't able to come and demolish the city of Medina because that was also one of their objectives. Come and kill everyone, finish this religion off, and we don't have to worry about it anymore. But instead they had to settle for a type of victory. And that is that they weren't defeated, that they weren't overcome by the Muslims. But at the same time, none of their major goals were accomplished. And so Allah Azza wa Jal then says, وَلَقَدْ عَفَ اللَّهُ عَنْكُمْ And Allah Azza wa Jal pardoned you. He forgave you for that which you did. And that is because those companions that, that surveyed the command of the Prophet wasallam, they left their post. It was a genuine mistake from them. And so Allah Azza wa Jal forgives what are genuine, sincere mistakes made by people if they don't do it to subvert the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jal is someone who has grace and bounty that he bestows upon the believers. He forgives them and he accepts their tawbah and Allah Azza wa Jal showers his mercy upon them. So those companions, they left their post and Allah Azza wa Jal forgave them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used this as a lesson for the people of the companion or the, for the companions and for the people on that day on the battlefield of Uhud. And it is also a lesson therefore for the Muslims to come after them as we have mentioned before. <clears throat> we therefore see that it is possible that a Prophet of Allah, as we can see from the story of the Battle of Uhud, that a Prophet of Allah Azza wa Jal can be injured. That there were Prophets of Allah who did die, who were killed and murdered by their people. It is possible for Prophets of Allah to suffer loss within battle. All of these things are possible, as we see from the Battle of Uhud and from the lessons that we have drawn from, from that. And so, as we've said before, one of the greatest reasons and one of the greatest uh, wisdoms behind that is that Allah Azza wa Jalla uses these events and these circumstances to differentiate between the people and to show those people who are true in their iman, true in their in their in their steadfastness, in their patience, true in their resolves as Muslims. All of this stuff becomes apparent in times of difficulty. And that's not only in times of battle, but in times of any type of personal strife and difficulty and any type of hardship. You will often see in times of bereavement when people love those who are closest and dearest to them, in times of financial calamity, in times of uh, being struck down by illness and disease, that is when you often see the true character of people. There are those people who will remain steadfast, patient, thankful to Allah Azza wa Jal, use that as a means of coming closer to Allah Azza wa Jal and to increase in worship and in righteousness and in servitude. And there are those people who will, you, you will see their true character. People who become evil in their nature and in their character. People who become nasty, people who become rude, people who become obnoxious or arrogant or whatever it may be. Different things that, and different ways in which people emerge. And that is why tests and trials are one of the ways in which you see the reality of a person. So the Prophet وسلم, on the occasion when he passed by a woman who had lost someone very close to her, and so she was screaming and she was she was extremely upset because of what had just taken place. The Prophet وسلم, saw her and he recommended to her that she be patient. Patient in this most difficult of circumstances. The Prophet وسلم, when he saw that she wasn't responding, that she was responding in the same way, the Prophet وسلم, left her and he walked away. 
the people around her said, don't you realize that you just spoke like that to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? She came chasing him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she said, oh Messenger of Allah, I didn't realize that it was you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded and he said, indeed patience in the Sammati Ula. True patience is when calamity first strikes. That is when you see a person's level. That is when you see a person's true ability, true uh, true patience, true steadfastness in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why throughout the Quran you will see multiple stories of prophets of Allah in times of difficulty, in times of tribulation, in times of trial and hardship. You see throughout the Quran that Allah Azza wa mentions countless, in countless times, on countless occasions, the stories of the likes of the prophets Ibrahim and Musa and Isa and uh, the prophets of Allah Azza that he sent down to us, their stories, because they go through hardship, they go through difficulty. Allah Azza wa praises in the Quran the likes of Yaqub and Yusuf and Ayyub والسلام, because they were prophets of extreme resolve, prophets of, prophets of patience and steadfastness, who when calamity befell upon them, they came closer to Allah Azza wa And so likewise here in the Battle of Uhud, these companions suffered a great loss. 70 odd of their number were martyred on that day. Their Prophet وسلم, was injured. There were rumors being spread that he had been killed وسلم, alongside other major companions like Abu Bakr and Umar. Anhuma. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned that defeat into a victory for the believers and he stopped the disbelievers from having the victory that they so wanted. And Allah then concludes this verse by saying, Wallahu dhu fadlin ala al mu'mineen. And indeed Allah is most gracious to the believers. There is one verse left on this page, but inshallah ta'ala we will take that in context with the next passage or the next page because it is related with uh, the verses that will come there. And so inshallah with that we conclude with today's episode. Barakallahu feekum. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.